Bird, 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 bird. Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Well, this this is awkward, because what do I say every time you hit play for the Hunting Dog Podcast? And it dawned on me. I said it the other day. I'm like, why would I feel inclined to say? Hey, everybody, it's Ron Bame from the Hunting Dog Podcast. You already picked it on your Spotify or your iTunes or whatever you're listening to it on. And I, I got an email from a guy who asked me about a podcast I did years ago, I think all the way back in my first or second year. And uh, he said, Ron, I, I, I learned, uh, he had asked me if I ever did an episode. I think it was on, oh, I forget what dog breed it was, but... I said, yeah, I, I did one on something about that once upon a time. And I told him, all you have to do is go to Libsyn slash Hunting Dog Podcast and look up directory and all nine years of podcasts are on there. Well, he was listening to one. This guy, he's been around the bird dog world for a while. He's just an acquaintance of mine. I actually never met each other. But once you talk enough times on emails and Zoom rooms and stuff, you do feel like you know somebody. And uh, he said, you did one with Ed Bailey, and I remember listening to it, and I went back, and there it was, and I clicked it, and he said, like 37 or 38 minutes, it went back to start. And I said, well, that's kind of weird. And uh, I said, are you sure you just didn't hit the button? Because, you know, like anybody could hit that wrong, or who knows what your Android Auto does or whatever you're using. Anyway, so I, I looked up the Lipson directory, and, and I hit it, and I played it, and I listened to it. And I had literally, I, I, I'm not going to say I forgot that I did an interview with Ed Bailey. And for those of you who don't know nothing, Ed Bailey was one of the, well, besides one of the founders of the North American Bristol Hunting Association, um, he was a brilliant, a brilliant dog and animal behaviorist, and he wrote a column in Gun Dog Magazine for, I uh, say, years, probably decades. Um, the amount of time's not important. They were, that was my go-to art. You know, when I get a Gun Dog back in the day, I'd open up. Oh, there's Ed Bailey's Ed Bailey's article, and somebody was always writing in about a dog that bit, or a dog that was afraid of fireworks, or a dog that you know, all these behavior qu questions. You know, and it, it, I found them fascinating, and I found it fascinating for years judging dogs when I see behavior that I'm like, eh, is that nature? Is that nurture? What is it? So because I listened to that, and sadly it did disappear at 37 minutes, I just wanted to put one, this one out there because I, I wish I'd have got him back on the phone. I wish I'd, it's when I was starting out, I wish I would have traveled and met people in their homes more often. I, I did that from time to time, but you know, I, I wasn't, uh, what would you say, um, professional? I'm not professional now, but, you know, I figure at, th at this length of time, this is probably what I'm going to do till they uh, cover me up with some dirt and some daisies. And uh, it, 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 what also struck me was when I listened to it, I started out with, good evening, everybody. This is Ron Payne from the Hunting Dog Podcast. I was like, God, you've been saying that forever. So two things. I hope you enjoy this because there's some, even though it's only 37 minutes long, there's some good takeaways from it. There really is some good takeaways. We talk about dogs that are all run. We talk about dogs that bite. We talk about dogs that are soft. And you got to listen to Ed's answers. Ed, he's just, when it, when it comes to problem solving, and of course that's always a near impossible task when you can't see the dog, and you're just listening to someone's or reading someone's email about what you hope they're giving you as much information as they can. And, I mean, this this man was uh, a treasure, and he's he's been gone now for a bit. But uh, anyway, after listening to that, even though it's only 37 minutes, I said, you know what? 
I think there's enough new listeners out here, even a few of you that have been around since the beginning, that probably haven't listened to Ed. Now, this is, now we know I don't have great, great audio quality. I'm not that guy. I don't have an engineer. I don't have, I don't have a Brandon Morton like my buddy Travis. Oh, speaking of that, speaking of Travis, Frank, and the flush, I was on his podcast last week, and I haven't listened to it, but we did, or he put that episode out. He told me it was going to go right out on Thursday. And uh, he, he saw the Behind the Dog clip on Instagram and literally texted me that same day and says, hey, you want to come on and sh talk about Behind the Dog? I said, well, of course I do. So if you want a really good, informative podcast to listen to after you listen to this 37 minutes of Ed Bailey, because we get into some behavioral things there too um, with Travis. But check out Travis Frank's podcast that I was just on last week. And then I don't have to go on and on about Behind the Dog and what a great film series it's, it is and is going to become. And you can find out about how the next episode is going to all be all about... It, this isn't a breeder interview. It's, a, uh, it's an episode we filmed over the course of, uh, of... It was filmed two summers ago with a young poodle pointer. And, you know, everyone knows that I tested a lot of, or tr judged a lot of dogs, tested, you know, a couple handfuls of my own. And uh, part of any of the versatile tests, or even some of the AKC and other tests, if you sign up for that part of it, is I think any hunting dog should go in the water. I think a dog that doesn't go into water is laughable. And I've owned a couple that couldn't swim good, didn't use their back legs. I've had some that weren't going to make a great, you know, a great water dog, but in the event my bird got shot and went into the Missouri River like it did one time or into a lake or into a ditch, yeah, I don't want a dog to go up to that water neck like, you know, he can't go in there. So anyway, the one that's going to be coming out in the beginning of July is all about this journey and the because we get lucky sometimes. I've been luckier more times than not with dogs that just like, yep, I'll go swimming. Well, I'll tell you right now, I have a little cocker spaniel named V. And that dog doesn't want to go into water. She can swim. I've seen her swim. She doesn't want to go into water. And my little Zuka, you know, the little crossbreed I've got here, she jumped off a dock the other day and now decided she doesn't want to swim. She swam good when she got back to the, to, until she got back to the dock and pulled herself up. Um, these things happen. And so anyway, this, this one we're going to release in the beginning of July um, is, about, uh, is about a young poodle pointer and its journey to becoming a duck dog. Yeah, so, so we got that. Um, I'm going to go to this real quick. My title sponsor, OnX Hunt, OnX Maps, OnX Everything, Pike Gear, Technical Clothing for the Upland Hunter, Boss Shot Shells, Waltons, Gunner Kennels, Garmin, W Hunting Supply, Purina Pro Plan, K9 Athlete, and, of course, the Upland Institute, which does not sponsor the podcast, but it's owned by me, you know, half, half by me. Anyway, well, there's my wife calling, so it's a good time to quit my yammering, and you can listen to Ed Bailey and I from eight years ago. Good evening, everybody. This is Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. Today I have with me on the phone Ed Bailey. Ed is, uh, my, my knowledge of Ed comes through my background with NAVDA. Uh, Ed was one of the founding uh, members in test format people in NAVDA. He is a... Uh, well, Ed, why don't you just introduce yourself? I, I know you've got 15 different degrees, and you're a specialist in animal behaviorists, but give us a little background on yourself, Ed. Well, I don't have quite 15 degrees. <laughs> That's just three. Just three? That's three more than I have. <laughs> and, um, no, I've been, uh, I was just interested in dogs from the day I was born, I guess. I got my first dog when I was two years old. Wow. And I've had dogs ever since. That was a, a, a smooth-coated fox terrier. Uh, I got my first bird dog when I was uh, 16, and I got them from a friend. He had to get rid of his dogs, and he gave me two dogs. One was a six-month-old English setter, and the other was a 10-year-old English setter. So that was my first introduction to the bird dogs. To the bird and dogs. Then I got uh, in with some other friends, they had people I knew, and they had uh, one guy had a short hair, another guy had uh, a pointer. 
pointer, English pointer, and they needed somebody to take care of them and run them and work them and play with them and stuff. So that's what I was doing. And I would um, come home from school uh, about four o'clock and uh, grab a bunch of dogs and walk across the bridge. There was the Schuylkill River Bridge in Pennsylvania, in Hamburg, Pennsylvania, and um, across the bridge, down a dirt road, and oh, maybe a mile, I guess, I'd walk totally with the dogs, and then get to this field, and then I could release them, and we could find pheasants. Um, the ironic thing is that that field now is Cabela's parking lot. <laughs> That's the, the parking lot? I've been to, I know exactly where you're talking about. That that's kind of a probably a, a kind of a sad look back at it when you. Had, uh, well, they, they put a clover leaf in it uh, there too, and um, on the highway it put up Cabela's store, and along with all the other stuff that goes along with Cabela's. Sure, all but, the hotels and gas stations and everything yeah, else. Yeah, all the banks and the, you know. But well, anyway, uh, then uh, I I just was with my dogs until I got drafted into the Army at, uh, uh, when I was 21. Uh, and I had applied, I'd been working to get some money, and I applied to school and uh, in pre-vet medicine, actually. And I got my acceptance to Franklin Marshall in pre-vet medicine, and I got my draft notice in the same day. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I take it you didn't dodge the draft then. Yeah, I went in the army. He didn't dodge drafts in those, in those days. Yeah. And uh, that was uh, about the middle of the Korean War. Okay, so in the, it was in the 50s then. Yeah. Okay. And, and um, when I got out of the army, I uh, went to school at the University of Montana and uh, worked there in wildlife and wildlife behavior. I did my bachelor's there, and I did all my master's there as well in wildlife behavior, working on mule deer, actually. And then I moved to um, Penn State, and I was, I was uh, going to go to um, Par Harbor, Maine. Uh, I had talked to um, a friend, I had talked to John Scott for me, and Scott is the guy who ran the Great Big Dog Study up there for oh, from the 40s until uh, about the sick early 60s. And they were doing all sorts of dog uh, behavior work. And I'd uh, gotten into Scott. And he, he said, but the only trouble is, they only have a, an agreement with the University of Maine, and they only offer the master's degree. But you already have one of them, so you don't need another one. <laughs> I said, oh, don't. He says, well, the only other person that I could think of uh, who be, help, could help you with behavior is Dave Davis at Johns Hopkins. So I applied there, to, uh, got accepted, except Davis moved from Johns Hopkins up to Penn State. So I went to Penn State instead of Johns Hopkins. Okay. And uh, did work out there on behavior. And from there, went to Montana again. Uh, this time as faculty at the university and stayed there for a little over a year and then was offered the job here at Guelph at the university to start the behavior, wildlife behavior program. So I jumped at that. And that's, and how, I, that's how you ended up in, in Canada? That's then. how I ended up in Canada, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, uh, in, uh, what, about what year was that, Ed? And well, they gave me the, uh, the part of the agreement was that I didn't teach in the fall. Oh, you, you worked that into your... your. Yeah. I had my fall free. So yeah. I was off from September until January. Wow. From teaching so I could uh, they, get, they, my, get my hunting in. They must have really wanted you. <laughs> I, I know if I hired somebody and they said, hey, I need to fall off, I said, well, you might as well take the rest of the year off. <laughs> but well, it, worked, uh, it worked out fine for me. Well, yeah, I would think so. You know, predominantly, then you were you were you did you hunt all over the place, or did you hunt just around, you know, no, Canada? Uh, no, no, no. I, I looked around here first, and uh, they, they were rough grouse, and they were woodcock. Right. Uh, but that was about it. 
and uh, I wanted to hunt some pheasants and play on things. So I um, got a hold of a, of a person out in Nebraska, and uh, they invited us to stay at their house. So went out there hunting for the first time in 1965. Wow. Wow, that that kind of reminds me of when I was talking with Ben Williams, how he showed up in Montana with his Britneys, and the 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 game uh, the game warden when he applied for his license, he asked him if he wanted an elk license or a mule deer license. He says, "No, I want a small game license." And yeah. He said, "The only thing out there is rattlesnakes and coyotes. You got the whole place to yourself." So, yeah. what, what was it like in the '60s in Nebraska? Wow. Uh, I, I, I can recall plenty of times when uh, the dog went on point and was just sort of creeping along and I could see pheasants running ahead of her. Uh, and uh, it got into a, a, a willow clump or a swampy area and the cattails and willows growing up and got right up to it and pheasants started going up. And I shot one rooster, I shot the second one reloaded, shot the third one, and then watched the other 75 go by. Oh. That's how it was in the 60s. Wow. Because the limit was three a day. <laughs> so I had my three in, in five minutes. Jeez. I mean, I, I think nowadays the only place you could do that is either at a preserve or at some of these places yep. where they just push the birds out the end of the field. You're not, you're just not going to... This is all wild birds. Right, right. It's just... Just the, way, just the way it was back then, I guess, right? Yeah. 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 And, um, oh, gosh, uh, I guess in the, uh, in the in this century, after 2000, uh, I was hunting in that same area in Nebraska, and I saw two birds. Oh. Three days. That had to break your heart. Yeah, that did. <laughs> uh, I haven't been up there since. And, uh, You know, something, it's a little, it's its on topic with hunting dogs and everything, which is what we're going to talk about, of course, in, in hunting stories. But I, I always wanted to, you know, I grew up in, the, you know, I, I was born in the 50s, so I didn't really do any bird hunting with my own dog, really, until the, in my late 20s where I owned a dog. And so in the 60s, there wasn't truck boxes, and what did you? How did you transport your dogs? Because I always heard a friend of mine's dad say that the dogs rode in a trunk. Oh, <laughs> how did you transport your dogs in um, the '60s? Yeah, uh, I had a station wagon. Okay. Um, a French car, a Peugeot, actually. The Peugeot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Peugeot was the name of the car, and. Um, uh, it had a great big back end. I could put three dogs in there. I had a rack on the top, so I could load all the uh, all the gear up top, and in the back seat, and three dogs in the back of the car. And they rode fine. It was plenty of space for them. You know, so it, they were barricaded to the back, but they weren't cages. Right. They were just loose, but they couldn't come over the seat. Right. You know, I think that's a good thing to start on. I, um, I always, a lot of my podcast, I, I always blend back to the word cooperation in a dog. And, you know, that exists in, you know, all canines to some degree or not. Um, yeah. You didn't have training collars back in those days, right? No. Did you, did, did people still have the dogs that you let out of the truck and they just ran off to the horizon like a bunch of ninnies? Or were dogs a little different back in the '60s? Uh, um, or, or are people just relying on this too much? I, I, I've always I, had a wonderment about that. I had Griffons, but I, I also hunted with, with uh, English pointers before I left to Pennsylvania. Uh huh. In the army, and uh, I had one uh, pointer who was a granddaughter of the Texas Ranger. And the Texas Rangers, the biggest winning pointer ever. He won the Grand National Hunt of the Hunt up many times. Wow. And, and the grandfather on the other side was Tyson, who also won the Grand National. So you'd think this would be a dog that would just go 100 miles an hour and way out. Right, exactly. 
she didn't. She was within gun range, to, almost to a fault. Now, how do you, you know, as a behaviorist, do you, is there a way to explain that, or is it just lucky? Um, I don't know, uh, but uh, uh, I got the dog when she was 12 weeks old from um, a guy. He, he was the last one that was left over from the litter, and, and um, uh, got the dog at a friend's place the next two houses from me and his can. Yeah, that doesn't sound like the typical pointer of e- of any decade in this country, you know. Yeah, that's, uh, well, um, yeah, that's, that's basically, you know, people breed dogs that win. Right. And, and what wins a field trial is the biggest going fastest dog. Right, right. And, point, and all that to do is stop and point and stay steady to flush and, and shot, and that's it. Right, kind of like a kind of like the guys in the bass tournaments. They got to get to the other side of the lake as quick as they can. <laughs> What's that? It's kind of like the bass tournament people. They they get the fastest boat to get across the lake as fast as they can. Exactly. You know, and so, but speak on that a little bit with, with range in a dog. You know, is that part of a dog's behavior? Is that something he learns? No, um, um, but it's innate, and and you can control it, but it's it's. And the, the dogs that win the field trials are the biggest going ones. So these are the ones that get bred. Those dogs that, that would be what most hunters would want, they don't uh, get bred. Right, right. And that's in the field trial world, of yeah, course. So there's a, 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 a very active selection for dogs that go far and fast. Right. Right. And, and so uh, will that dog not, just start reproducing itself in general? The, the, oh, yeah. The, generation yeah. gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, until, um, remember, uh, there was a setter one uh, not too long ago named uh, Snowstorm. And um, that, that dog would, on the breakaway, might go in a straight line for 25 miles. Oh, good Lord. And if it didn't hit a bird, it never stopped. <laughs> you know, but if it hit a bird, it stopped. But if it didn't hit, find a bird, it was gone. And they find it 25 miles away. Um, I, well, I was working with pheasants here uh, some years ago, and uh, uh, I had to uh, lease a farm nearby. And um, the lady phoned me, she said, one of your dogs is over here with the, the pheasant pen. And I, I went over, and it wasn't my dog, but I went over, and it was a short hair. And I, the dog was lying down, sleeping, when I got there. And so I, I checked the dog's collar. It was a name uh, from a guy in London, Ontario, which is 70 miles away. Um, and I thought, well, maybe there's a field trial nearby and I called the place that would have a field trial. I said, are you having a trial today? Yes. He said, he said and I knew the guy, he was one of my colleagues at the university. Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're having a, a trial. I said, have any dogs been lost? He says, a couple. <laughs> a couple. And I said, okay, I have one of them here. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it over. <laughs> so I'm driving uh, the road to uh, from my house toward his place on a gravel road. And uh, I see a car coming in. I could see the guy looking left and right. And so I stopped and I flagged him down. And I said, uh, are you uh, looking for a short hair? He says, yeah. And he says, did you see it? I says, yeah, it's in my car. He says, where? I don't see it. <laughs> it's starting there in the back sleeping. <laughs> Is that your dog? He said, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's him. He said, boy, he's a real good derby dog. 
And I said, he must be that grass that he made is five miles. Wow. From where, from where he let him loose to where I got him. That's... This guy, he's a good runner. And I said, um, he's uh, from most guard breeding, isn't he? He said, how do you know that? <laughs> and I said, well, I can tell by the dished out nose and the spots. You mean the, the, the pointer type? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the only thing short here about that dog was his cropped tail. Right. You know, it's funny you said Mosgard. My first, what I call good short hair I had, good hunting short hair, huh? uh, was a Mosgard line bred. And one of my buddies was on a podcast with me, and he always said, if she didn't have a dock tail, she looked like a pointer. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But, um, Ed, let me, let me ask a couple of, uh, one person in particular wrote me recently, um, and I didn't have an answer for him at all. I've never actually heard of this. His dog, when he's in the house, it acts pretty damn normal. It's it's actually it's one of my breed, the Italian uh-huh. pointers. So you know we we probably got a little, I don't know, small gene poolitis going on there. But yeah. he says when that dog goes outside, it starts chasing shadows to the point where it can't do anything else. Literally, you know, just its own shadow or or any you know. And he yeah. says, this dog, he says it looks like a Looney Tune cartoon. Um, and not that you can, you know, obviously with that short of a description without knowing the dog's age, wh- yeah. what would do What would do that to a, a canine? Well, um, it's, it's called an obsessive-compulsive disorder. Okay. And um, <clears throat> what it is, the dog at uh, one time chased the shadow, and that was fun. Okay. Yeah. He couldn't catch it, but he was chased. It was fun. So the next one is he sees it's fun too. So it just accelerates and escalates until he's doing it continuously all the time. Uh, there are several things that, that dogs do that are like this. Um, one is this uh, fly snapping. Mm-hmm. But will sit and snap it at imaginary flies for hours. Really? Yeah. And um, um, in other words, they sort of they're stargazing, but they're just looking at the ceiling and looking all around the ceiling for something. Who knows what? And it's, it's uh, not a very easy thing to get past because to do it is self-rewarding. Oh, okay, sure. Sure. And, and so you have to get some way to to intercede, and the, you you for that kind of a disorder, you have to go to drugs. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. You have to go to something that's going to mellow the dog out, mm. and then reward the dog for not doing it. Could could the dog eventually? I mean, you know, in a best case scenario. Could the dog eventually get off the drugs and turn its energy toward a correct behavior? Uh, probably outside the yard, it doesn't do it. Yeah, see, I, I didn't get that much information from him. You're right. I would, I would suspect that if he takes it out in the field of hunting, it's a whole different story. And the dog probably, probably is okay on the, uh, on the field someplace. Well, I will, uh, I will write him back tomorrow. And, yeah. and and get a little bit more information because I you know I <clears throat> you know a lot of people because I have this rare breed I get a yeah. lot of I get a lot of questions um, uh, you know as everybody calls the softer dogs you know like a, an English Setter yeah. or, or a Griffin or a or a yeah. Bracco Spinolis yeah. um, and so one of my one of the other questions um, is dealing with. In, and I, I, somebody corrected me at a recent uh, dog function. They, you know, a soft dog, you know, don't use the word soft. But I, I don't know another way to explain it. It's a dog that you can't, you've got to just kind of really outsmart with your training. You can't put a lot of pressure on them. Yeah. Uh, what does that derive from? It's, uh, well, it's, it's uh, uh, it, the dog is just what I would call sensitive. And, and that he's very keen into you as, as a handler. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, but is also very sensitive to any uh, thing that 
you would uh, find uh, displeasing and, and raise your voice or uh, uh, anything like that. He, then, then he would cower. So that's where the that's the idea soft comes from. Right, right. And, and what it is is the dog is, is trying hard to please you, and if he dis if he displeases you for some reason and he gets scolded for it or anything, he overreacts. Okay. So, and uh, dogs dogs like that are for most people very difficult to train. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I I don't I don't find it so. To, well, you you remember when you were up here at the um, at that time, Bodo and I were given the. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yep. And uh, uh, I, I was handling a dog, and I don't know whose dog was a short hair uh, inside the building there. Mm-hmm. And uh, Bodo was working with dogs outside, and <laughs> and uh, this. I was working with a short hair, and I was handling him very quietly. And the guy says, you know, he says, you're the quietest dog handler I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> how do you ever get the dog to do anything for you? And I said, well, he's doing it, isn't he? He says, yeah, how do you do that? And that's what you have to do with dogs like that, is, is you be quiet and you lead them through. But you can't push them. If you push them, they uh, sort of set your feet and, and say, you can kill me, but I'm not going to do it. Right. Yep. Yep. You know, and another and some of that, I've noticed, you know, the Bracco, I would say it falls in that category of the more sensitive dog. Yeah. Um, they, you know, I, I think, and this is speculation, um, you know, it, it was pretty much in Italy for all these centuries. And they pretty much, you know, they bred them for as much of their beauty as they did their hunting ability. Yeah. So they and they they didn't get that jump start of of the the versatile testing like they started in you know in in east of the Rhine River. Yeah. And so they I think they they tend to be just they they do I've got some dogs through utility and there's a few prize ones out there. Um, seems to be all females, isn't that kind of interesting? That. <laughs> Um, I do have a male that went through it. But, yeah, I, I talked to the breeder in Hungary where I got him from, and I told him I was just the only thing I have trouble with this dog is he, he swam from day one I got him at 12 weeks. And in fact, he just walked right into a river in Florida where there was alligators, and I'm, I was freaking out. And yeah. he just went out and started swimming, you know. and But getting him to try to do a duck search... I, I was just struggling, and you know this breeder, I guess he knows his lines, and he says, just wait till he's about three years old, you'll see a different dog. And, and believe it or not, at three years old, he got a foreign duck search, and I didn't do anything different. He just decided yeah. to, I don't know if that's a guy yeah. knowing his lines well, or, you know, they say yeah, a dog. Yeah, that, and he knows that the dog is slow to mature. It, so that is a, you know, when you hear that expression, that is a that is a true mark of some breeds, then, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, Brittany Spaniels tend to be this way. Slow to mature. Yep, slow to mature, and and also very sensitive. I'll be damned. See, I only I only well, I you know I've judged quite a few, but I've never spent time with them, you know, in a training sense or anything. Yeah. Well, the the only Bronco I've ever seen is Jack Jack Hayes. Sure. I, yeah, I've seen Jacks. You know, you know, you've seen that dog probably, haven't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's the only one I've ever seen working in the field. And, uh, he, he was a surprising dog, actually. Yeah. I, I didn't expect him to be so... Um, um, I expected it to be sort of gangly and disjointed and, and stuff when, when he ran, but he wasn't. He, he was really good. Uh, a nice floating action to the dog and uh, he ran beautifully so you were kind of expecting the dog to be like Jack then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry Jack if you're listening to this uh, um, you know something when I met you this is stuck in my head since the day I met you you mentioned that you should have never put the down command in the last chapter of the green book 
Yeah. I did. Yeah, you did. You said I should have never. You, you said people never ever go to the end of the book. They start training right. and, and they don't finish the book. Yeah, they don't, they, nobody uses it. <laughs> right, and, and I, I do all the time. Yeah, and <laughs> I've used it. And you told me that it's the most dominant you will be over your dog. Yeah. And speak on that a little bit. What what that does, and, and I'll, I'll just try to, you know, for a few people who are new or, or haven't don't have the background or, or maybe never even taught their dog to do anything besides sit, you know, down in a classic sense is, and, and jump in if I say this wrong, Ed, when you give the dog a down command, it is not only laying on the ground, as long as it's not hot and panting, its chin is is stuck to the ground like Velcro. Yeah. And, and I went right through the green book, and I did that to a few of my dogs, and it is a, it was amazing how that established me as the boss of the dog. Oh, yeah. But what is it about a dog that, you know, like we, try, we get a dog to be steady to wing shot and fall, and you know no dog wants to be that way naturally. Yeah. And we get them to do that. It doesn't seem to change anything. They can still be little assholes and run around, <laughs> you know, yeah. screw up the next part of a test. But when they're in down, they're like, they have no recourse. I mean, what is it about the down command in a dog? Is it something in the canines from no. the mom no. scolding a dog? Or what is, how does that tie into the dog psyche? They, they, are, total, they are totally in a total submissive posture. And um, well, uh, well, I was told one time by um, um, Tobble, uh, the German fellow, Dr. Tobble, he, uh, he trained his dogs that way. And uh, he said that uh, uh, when his dogs misbehave, he makes them crawl by making go down and then come. As soon as they start to get up and move a little bit, he down. So they're up and down, up and down, up and down. And he said, they never do that bad behavior again. Really? Yeah. That That's really interesting. Now, I mean, I'm going to, of course, I'm not going to go home and start, you know, doing it to the puppies. What age, again, now we're talking about a lot of dogs mature earlier. I, and I know we won't get too much into NAVDA testing and everything because a lot of the listeners are field trial people and, and other dog enthusiasts. But at, at what age is it safe to start doing, like, the, a, a true down command where you put some heavy training on it? Because you and I know people people are getting these dogs th- through testing. I, I, I say way too young, but apparently the dog can handle it. I don't know what it does to the dog. Yeah. But... Uh- Yeah. But it depends on the individual dog. Sure. At nine months, some dogs are uh, just like other dogs are at four months. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I agree. They they just don't. Yeah, they act very young. They don't act like they want to challenge yeah. you yet or anything like. But when that. I say not, when I say nine months, I mean nine months behaviorally. Yeah. Uh, not chronologically. Mm-hmm. Okay. They have to be psychologically ready for it. Right. And, and if, it, if they're too young, you can you can wreck them. Put it, down. Is the down, let's say people, a few people listen to this and say, you know, I'm going to go back and read my old green book, and I'm going to teach my dog down. If you've got an older dog that you, you're pretty sure is stable, it's it's is it ever too late to teach down, or is that... Uh, Okay. And, and it, it doesn't matter if they're four years old or whatever. Okay. I I know I was so I, I got so pumped up after meeting you and Bodo up there in Canada. I went home and I took my German wire hair who who was just not the typical German wire hair, other than he did fight with other male dogs. Um, but he was a real sweetheart in general. And and he could take a lot of training, and I taught him down, and he 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 learned it really really quick, and and he stuck to it. I could, 
I could bring him to like a picnic and have a little kid there and I'd say, come over here, I'm going to show you how to train a dog. And I would, I would teach the boy to put the dog on down and no matter what I would do, you could make noises or food, that dog would not pick his head up off the ground. And I used him a lot of times jump shooting uh, geese and ducks on ponds and stuff. And, you know, and, you know people just cannot believe. I, in fact, I've never gotten another dog that good at it. So are, are some dogs, is it, is it just? Oh, yeah. Is, is it? I don't, it's not like snowflakes. They're not all different. But there's got to be certain, like, categories. Like some dogs, you know, kind of resent it. Other dogs just seem to take it. Like. That's it, just, just like a like a stop motion photography. Yep. Wow. And two days later, I was out with him, and we were in some uh, tall grass, and all of a sudden, a young buck jumped up right in front of him. He'd been laying down in the grass, and <laughs> jumped right up in front of him, and took off, and he was going to go right after it, and I just whipped on the whistle again, and he again went down. Wow. So you basically broke him a chasing at the same time. Yeah. From, well, from then on, he'd see the deer and he'd stop dead. <laughs> and did you, did, let me ask you another thing. Did, have you over the, obviously when you started doing this, you know, many years ago, did you do everything, you know, by hand, old school, or did you jump on things with the electric collar when, oh, no. when it came around, what was your philo- or what is your philosophy with no, it? Uh, my, my my philosophy of training is, is totally different from that. It's uh, I, I I feel the dog's working, and if he gets paid for working, he's going to do a better job of it. So I would I tend much more to go to a positive reinforcement. Okay. And I use the collar only after the dog is trained. And, and like 100% trained? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then it's only the, and, uh, if it's going toward a skunk or a raccoon or a porcupine, I, then I can tap him with a collar. Sure, sure. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that I, to me, that's always been the handiest thing about a collar. Yeah. I, it, it, to stop them. Right. Rather yeah. than. You don't train. There's another. There's a way that people use um, where they'll shock a dog until the dog does the thing they want, and then they stop the shock. And stopping the shock is the reward the dog gets for doing what the 
that I want. Yeah, it, it turns off the pressure. Yeah. Uh, the pinch here is, is the same sort of thing. Sure, sure. Uh, it's it's putting, putting, giving pain until the dog does what you want, and then you release the pain. It's, it's uh, they call it positive-negative. Uh, and uh, I don't like it because it takes a certain kind of dog to put up with that. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I, it has to be a really hard constitution dog. And you get a dog that's the least bit sensitive, and it can do one of two things. It can bite you, or it can uh, cave in. Sure. And, and if it caves in, well, then nobody wants the dog. Uh, if it bites, they say put it down because it's untrainable. Um, uh, years ago, some years ago, a guy wrote to me, and I wrote it up in, in, in Gundog, one of the early columns. It's now, the dog is still alive, and the dog was two years old then, and it's 13 now, so that's how long ago it was. 11, uh, 11 years ago. Yeah, 11 years ago. And, 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 um, Somebody was trying to do this with the dog. He took it to, to a trainer, a pro trainer, it was a NAVDA. He took him to, and um, uh, the dog was retrieving, but didn't want to give up the dummy or the bird or whatever. It would just want to keep it for himself, right? bring it right up to him, but then stand there or back off. So he wanted it to deliver the hand. So the way this uh, trainer was doing it was to shock the dog until it retrieved and brought the thing to him. Now, the dog bit him. <laughs> so. And he told the owner, that dog um, is going to hurt somebody. You've got to put him to put her down. And um, uh, he says, you'll, you'll never be able to do anything with that dog, and he's going to hurt somebody. The guy had a nine-year-old daughter. And he was afraid of the dog biting. Sure. Her. And so he wrote to me and asked me what he could do. 